um, we have a quorum, so we'll open the meeting. Would the um, staff please call the roll? Yes, uh, Chair Bauer? Here. Vice Chair Corey? Here. Board Member Kohler? Here. Board Member Bernstein? Here. Board Member McKinnon? Here. Board Member Wimmer, Wimmer is absent. Here. Oh, here. Board, board here. Member right Wimmer here. is here. Good, first up on our um, agenda is um, oral communications. Anyone that wants to speak to any uh, item not on the agenda is welcome to do that right now. I don't have any cards for that, so <laughs> let's move on to the uh, next item, which is um, ag agenda changes, announcements, additions, deletions. Just, um, I have one announcement is that we have a subcommittee item, uh, 526 Waverly, that's going after today's meeting, after we adjourn. So um, we've already contacted the board members um, who are involved in that, and they've said they are available. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, we actually have people here today, which is um, a remarkable occurrence for us. <laughs> and I'm assuming that uh, the bulk of the people here are, are here to uh, talk about the Eichler guidelines. So we have one agenda item before that. I'd like board members, if they can, to be very concise in their comments about the Junior Museum, which is first up on our um, agenda staff report. Yes, I'm going to keep it brief as well. We have our applicants here who will go through their PowerPoint. This will be going to the Architecture Review Board on March 1st. Um, the council approved this project and uh, back in December, and this is just a, a minor change uh, to, to address um, what the applicant is going to tell you about. Okay. And the material board's here. Good, mem good morning, board members. Thank you for having us today. Let me make this full size. just off this. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so just a quick recap um, of the existing site conditions. The existing Junior Museum and Zoo sits here. Also on the, the large city-owned parcel is the historic Category 1 Lucy Stern Community Center as well as the eligible historic resource of the Lou Henry Hoover Girl Scout House. Um, the the Rinconada Park sits here. Adjacent is the Walter Hayes um, Elementary School, and then across the way is a residential neighborhood. In our proposed site plan, we're making um, big improvements to clarify site circulation for pedestrians, bikes, and vehicles. We're also reorganizing the JMZ to create a more civic presence for that institution and um, referencing the Lucy Stern and a lot of the form and, and layout of the building. We were presented to the full HRB back in June of last year. This was the, the rendering that we brought forward at that point in time. In general, the board was very favorable with the design. There was concerns about the color of the uh, material, the metal roofing material that also turned on this onto the exterior walls in some locations. So we worked with a subcommittee on a number of color variations. This was one of the interim variations that we studied upon comments from the HRB subcommittee, ARB, and the community. This was the ultimate design that we presented and was approved last year by city council in December. Um, it has a taupe colored standing metal seam roof with cement plaster siding on the walls and some areas of wood siding for accents. We are here today to present a roofing change to you, um, going from a standing metal seam roof to a composite shingle roof. Um, while I understand that it's not part of the HRB's purview to review um, cost implications, this roofing change will save the project about almost half a million dollars, which will allow us to stay in budget and um, keep very important and exciting visitor experiences in the project. So we are proposing again going from a taupe colored standing metal seam roof to a composite asphalt shingle roof in a light sage green color. Um, the durability 
of this roof is not quite as durable as its standing metal seam. However, we can get a warranty for a full warranty for up to 20 years and then an extended warranty for 21 to 50 years beyond that. This is just a quick um, aesthetic image of the standing metal seam roof versus the composite shingle that we're presenting today. This is a rendering from Middlefield. You can see um, we've um, replaced the roofing with the, the composite shingle. So it will be visible along Middlefield from the main entrance in the parking lot. You can see the roofing in the distance, but it's a pretty, um, there's not a lot of view to the roof from this perspective. Just to circle back to the surrounding context, the Lucy Stern complex has a clay tile roof with cement plaster walls. The Lou Henry Hoover Girl Scout house has composite shingle roof and uh, vertical wood siding. The existing JMZ building, which will be demolished when our new building is built, it does have a wood shingle roof just for, as a point of reference. And then across Middlefield, most almost all of the residential houses have composite shingle roofing. That's in direct context. Um, one point of consideration, it's not part of the current project, but we are planning in the next five to 10 years to add photovoltaic panels to the roof. It'll cover almost half of the roof surface. Um, that will allow us to generate energy on site. And so the, the panels will be attached directly on top of the composite shingle roof, like these images show. And then a longer term consideration, again, not part of the project we're proposing today, but in 10, 20 years when the composite shingle roof starts to age, there's an opportunity with the extreme advances in photovoltaic roofing that the friends in the city could opt to replace the roofing with a, a photovoltaic roofing. This is an example of the Tesla roofing tiles that will allow for um, site generation of energy as well as a more comprehensive look for the roofing system. And that's it for our presentation. Um, thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Um, hold, can you just sure. hold on for a second? Uh, any questions by board members? I have a couple of short ones. No questions? Okay. So um, I'm, I'm pleased that we're saving money yes. as a Palo Alto resident. I think everyone here who is a resident is happy about that. I think um, that this is a more appropriate material choice. Didn't like the standing seam roof. When you said that you could get an extended 21 to 50 year warranty, I'm assuming that's on the materials, correct? Correct, I believe so. I, I can verify that though. And just so the, the, the public who is watching this at home knows, um, the material cost on any project, roofing project, are a minor portion of the actual roof contract. So while that helps, my uh, understanding of the, of the warranties, which is now five years, five years back because I've been retired for five years, is that it could be prorated, even if it was 100% of the cost, it would be minimal. But do you know whether, do you know anything about the warranty at all? Is it a just for, it is just for materials? I, I have the documentation. I haven't memorized it so I could forward it for further reference. Um, yeah, in the best case it's okay. In the best case then it is as I suspect, which is just materials, small amount, but savings are savings. So um, uh, I think that, that was my only question. Okay. All right, anybody else with a question? Roger. Well, um, if there is no other uh, input on this, let's Pull it, let's pull it back to the board and then have a board discussion. So thank you for that presentation. All right, board comments? Well, I was just gonna say I've had <clears throat> asphalt roofing on my house now for I don't know, 12 years, 13 years, and it was, still looks brand new in a way. It's a higher quality, and so it, and it looks great. So I think it's a good choice, practical, and will probably last a lot longer than what you think. So no problem for me. Any other, Mar uh, Margaret? I was gonna ask a quick, quick question. So the specification that you gave us, um, it's a cool roof. It's a cool uh, cool roofing. I, I was wondering if um, you might just state, just for our education, is why would you go with a cool roofing solution as as opposed to a traditional uh, roofing solution? I'm sure it's so that it's less um, solar absorption on in the material and it reflects the, the heat. Correct, should I respond now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Yes, you're exactly right. Um, 
basically it reduces the amount of heat that the, uh, the roof will absorb, which impacts how much energy we need to use to cool the building inside. It, the cool roof requirement is actually a California Green Building Code requirement. So there's limited roofing types that, that, that meet that requirement. So that's what the cool roof product information is in regards to. And then quickly, how did you um, arrive at the color of the sage green color? Um, so in the, in the product data you have, there are only four color options that fall into the, the cool roof category that meets the green building code. We thought the, the sage green was a nice complement to the, the white cement plaster and the, the wood accents that we're proposing. So if I can jump here before you leave, um, do you uh, know what the color of the Girl Scout building's roof is? It's a it's a brown. It's hard to tell in this image, but it's it's brown. It's very similar to the vertical wood siding color. And it is a composition. It's a composition roof. Correct. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's gone. It's gone. Okay. Thank you. Um, other comments. Michael. No, I think I I think I actually favor this over the uh, metal roof that we saw originally. I think it uh, provides a significant cost savings. I don't know what the cost for this roof is uh, the actual cost of it, but if you saved uh, half, a million, half a million bucks, you know, a lot of money. go for it. Okay, Brandon. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm a little, I think, uh, contrarian here, but I actually dislike the the composite roof. I think the metal actually does look better. Um, I think composite in general tends to be done because it's cheap, um, but I do understand the cost savings. I must be in the wrong business if it's a half a million dollars delta to do a roof. So, um, but uh, I appreciate I appreciate you uh, <laughs> your thoughts on saving money anyway. All right, um, Martin, you're the only one who has made a comment. Uh, I agree with uh, Board Member Kohler about the durability of it. Uh, I have a composition single roof on on my residence and it's installed it in 1992 and it, it still looks new. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right. No other comments. Um, I also forgot to um, uh, uh, acknowledge that Councilwoman Holman is here with us this morning. Thank you for coming, as you always do. Um, any, would you, any comments you'd like to make? No. All right, so I'm looking for a motion to move this forward. <coughs> well, I can craft a motion. <laughs> so uh, I would, um, let's see. So I think we need to say that this complies with the Secretary of Interior standards for uh, for uh, um, a, a differentiated but complementary material for the roof because we have two historic buildings within sight of this building that um, I would um, let's see uh, and that uh, this is uh, approved by the Historic Resources Board as being appropriate for this building. I'm open to any um, other suggestions. Sounds. All right. No. Oh, do we have a second? I'll second it if you. All right. All right. Uh, I don't see any other comments, so I think we can probably move this forward to um, a vote. So, uh, all in favor of approving this as appropriate. Uh, meeting the Secretary of Interior standards and being an appropriate roof material and cover for the museum, please say aye. Aye. None opposed. No, I opposed. Oh, sorry. Brendan opposed. All right. So we're five to one. All right. I just didn't hear you. It's okay. Well, I didn't say. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm hoping this makes it through the ARB without modification. Uh, and they'll hear that on March 2nd. All right, we'll move to uh, new business. I'm sorry, um, to our continued business, which is the public hearing of the uh, Eichler Neighborhood Design Guidelines. I'd like to remind anyone in the um, audience that if you'd like to speak to this item, please fill out one of these cards and give it to one of our staff members. Okay. 
staff report. Yes, hello. Um, coordinating, so thank you for announcing that uh, speaker cards are uh, what we need um, to track uh, who is speaking today. Um, this application, uh, this project has come before you um, initially November, then December, then G January, and now today. We've been at this for about a year um, with many workshops and um, you know, attended by uh, not everybody, but um, a core group and some others that um, more recently um, that heard that there might be a, a you know, potential for regulatory. Uh, right now, that is not the case. We are looking at guidelines, um, voluntary in nature, and um, going to council in April at this point. So here we are today, and here's the track. We have a website de devoted to this project. We have um, ways that folks can get uh, email e-blasts um, when they sign up. We recently blanketed all Eichler neighborhoods with notice cards. To, um, it was an undertaking. Um, we don't have ready lists of Eichler um, folks, but we, we did undertake that, and we will do it again prior to the council meeting. These are the Eichler neighborhoods in town. I've, I've spoken with um, one Eichler tract uh, that is interested in uh, removing the single story overlay, um, but that's only one. What did you say? What I've spoken with one. Remove what? Remove the single story overlay zoning. Oh, okay. It's an application process. <coughs> only one tract. Um, just a quick re recap, the staff report presented all of this, what's changed? You have a copy of both the annotated draft that shows the changes since you last saw these guidelines and the draft that is, has those changes incorporated. So the one draft that shows in orange the changes and the draft that will go to city council. So overview quickly, FAQs have been incorporated in an early section, hopefully to communicate to folks that this is voluntary. We've tried to hit that point several times. You know, how will we use it? I, you know, we, we would like to utilize, utilize these guidelines when we do individual review of two-story homes and second floor additions. The council would have to, of course, uh, ad adopt an ordinance regarding that. So you know, that's not even happening in April. That would be after April. Um, if the council so chooses to direct staff to come back. There's some key points of this, community values, that's been clarified. Um, the chapter on maintenance is now a later chapter. Um, the, the new construction is now an earlier chapter. And uh, chapter eight was modified to you know, remove some of that language that was causing people to uh, mistakenly believe that this was somehow regulatory. It is not regulatory, this is voluntary. I'll just say one more time, this is a voluntary set of guidelines that are being proposed. So with that, um, I think we need to get to the public, um, but if you have any questions or comments, um, staff would like to hear from you and um, as to the current set of guidelines. Okay, just as a recap, um, board members have received Two of these, which are the, the, the proposed guidelines, the original that we have reviewed earlier at one of our meetings and also all of us have read, and then a new annotated version which has orange changes. And I will tell, uh, because they're not available for the members of the public that are here, there are substantial changes that addressed a number of the comments that were made on the website or directly emailed to city staff. There are 236 comments that are in our package uh, today. I've looked at all of them. They're pretty um, extensive and we'll get to a discussion of, of the whole, the guidelines and these comments later. So let's move to um, a public, uh, hearing from the public. Uh, because we have, I currently have eight um, cards, I'd like to limit this to three minutes. And I, I request that if someone else has um, already spoken to an issue that you feel is important, simply note that you concur with that rather than um, spend the time basically saying the same thing that's already been said because we want to, we have um, lots of work to do here. So first person on the list is Ken Ventley, followed by Cynthia 
Yashimoto. So please uh, state your name uh, for, so that the... My name is Ken Benley. I live in uh, Eichler House near Gunn High School in Mayville Gardens. A day and a half ago I got this. It gave me a day and a half to come up with this response. However, living in Eichler, I've been there for a long time, and I'd like to ask any one of you, have any one of you ever owned or lived in an Eichler house? Good, okay. Well, anyway, um, that question's been answered. Uh, the problem I see in this report, there are a number of them. One of them is that they just spend a lot of time on remodeling, doing things to existing Eichlers. And, you know, we have a neighbor that had three additions on the roof in Eichler and they're atrocious, done years ago before this was even a discussed issue. We now have 30 houses in our tract and there are six that have been torn down and that are other types of architectural styles. So my question to you and into this report is that if you'll note in one of the pages here, page, uh, get my glasses out, 78, adding a basement to an Eichler. <laughs> Give me a break. I mean, you tear the house down, essentially. So we build a new Eichler, I presume, for a basement. But it does say something here very close. If a basement is added, residents should be aware that it may result in a house that is visibly higher than its neighbors. All the houses that are being built in Palo Alto now are on perimeter foundations. Nobody is building a slab house anymore like an Eichler. So I might show to you that when this takes place, and this was on the cover of the 2000, uh, June uh, 26, 2015 article on Eichler's Rising. I think some of you have seen it. Whoever the artist was and did it, did the greatest distortion fits exactly what I'm trying to say. We'll show you later. Eichler House, two-story house. Eichler House, I mean, two-story house sitting on a slab foundation. That is a joke. In here, it says that there's one article here at the back. I have three minutes, so that's why I'm moving fast. In neighborhoods that are not in flood zones, in my case it isn't, residents a flood zone designs new residences so that the floor level heights conform to those of a surrounding Eichler residences. You can't do that. An Eichler is that high off the ground at best. You start out with a perimeter foundation, you're going like this, maybe higher. You, and, and you see, as you said in here, if you build a basement, then you may have a higher one. Now with today's standards, today's standards, no one wants an, an eight foot high ceiling. They want a nine foot plate line. They want something higher. I have one being built, or there is one being built in our neighborhood. So we're already starting with a foot and a half, maybe, at the basement or at the floor level, uh, foundation level. Then you've got floor space, nine foot ceiling. Then you've got another floor. It's a goner for an Eichler. So this privacy issue of people looking down on you, we have it. We have one on a diagonal out of our, out of our backyard of our house. One was built there. We don't have a strong uh, neighborhood organization like the so-called uh, national registration things. My Eichler is a Jones and Emmons Eichler. It came even before the Anchin and Allen. And as you know, my problem with Eichlers is they built too many of them in Palo Alto. But when they built them, there was a great and interesting intention why they built them. Your it was an aesthetic. Could you, could you summarize? I'm going to summarize. Thanks. Thank you. I'm very upset about the problem. I resent the fact that my house is not in a, in a zone which has some privilege, which the others evidently have in this so-called uh, national registration. But uh, I have a number of other things, but thank you for your three minutes. Thank you, um, Mr. Bentley. Uh, Cynthia Hashimoto, please. I'm sorry if I'm not very good at pronouncing <laughs> names. Shimoto. Shimoto. And Steve Lewis is next up. So um, let's see. I'm going to admit that I'm kind of clueless as far as what the guidelines are. Could, could you uh, just say your name one more time? My name is Cynthia Ishimoto. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to admit that I am clueless to what the guidelines are. I'm now able to get involved in um, this because, well, this is what I have. 
Uh, let's see, I'm gonna backtrack. Eichler's, for those of you who don't know it, is a mid-century modern um, house that has a lot of glass. And I think one of the reasons why we have so many people going to the second levels is because it has really poor storage. Um, in my house, we have um, five-foot closets for everybody, and that's really not enough. The slanty roof means you have even less storage, and glass walls, even less storage. So the reason I'm here is because um, I, try, I, I inquired about um, putting an extension that would fit within the, um, um, the, the look, the aesthetics of an Eichler, and I was told that I could not do it um, because of piracy rules. Um, basically, there's a setback in my house. There's a garage, carport, and a setback, and I wanted to bring it forward. I was told I could not do it because of privacy reasons, even though I met the, the setback from the sidewalk, you know, that was acceptable. So I would like to find out what I can do, and does the guidelines have anything uh, that addresses what I want to do, which is pull the, pull the one section of my house forward and have it aesthetically match my two neighbors? So is there anything that that I can do to affect the guidelines or do I have an appeals process to figure out what I can do so that I can do more storage for my house? That's it. Great, thank you. Steve Lewis and John Melitor. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Lewis. I'm here for my neighbor, Pat Wang. He and I have been talking about Eichlers for years and years. We moved in in 56 and 57. Um, he basically found out and we looked at the research guideline. We liked the guideline as it was presented. Um, we don't like to see it as a rule. Um, there are so many Eichlers as you go down our streets that wouldn't match the rules as they are now with the guidelines. Um, you have two stories, I think three or four in our neighborhood. You've got ones that have been modified with different garage doors, different siding, different plumbing, um, heating and air conditioning on the roof that looks obnoxious, but that's the way they are. And that's the beauty of an Eichler. Um, and the guidelines do address a lot of the shortcomings of the Eichler homes, and we've all learned to put up with them, and that's what makes them unique. And. Uh, it's probably is what we in Eichlers like to believe is some of the best houses in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, John and then Diane Reckless. I'm John Melnichuk. I live in Fairmeadow. Um, I have a home there since 2002. It's an original home built in 1952. I'm surrounded on either side by original owners from 1952, quite elderly people. Um, I was involved in an ad hoc group in 2011 to get a single story overlay for Fair Meadow, and our effort failed. This was something that happened with David Toy and uh, five other members, or five other neighborhood members, and we collected our petitions. We got uh, the city to send a survey out, and at the last moment, uh, Vice Chairman Tuma, who was uh, chair of, or vice chair of the uh, architectural board at the time, said single-handedly that he would prefer to have things go forward only if 80% of respondents supported the idea of a single story overlay. We couldn't understand this at the time. Huh. You can check the tapes. I was speaking a little more loudly than I am right now when I responded to that. So uh, we have a concern in our, in our home, in our neighborhood, about slow emergence and creeping in of different architectural styles, two-story houses, that destroys our privacy, that destroys our daylight planes. Any of you would be welcome to come and visit our home to have a look for yourself to see what it feels like inside, and you could very easily be able to see what would happen with a two-story home next door or on either side of us. So uh, we're glad that some guidelines are being uh, developed here. For myself, I'm disappointed that we didn't achieve a single story overlay. I'd still like to see that happen. I don't know, that, that's beyond the scope of what your discussion is today, but I'm putting my two cents in. So, thank you so much for looking at this issue, and I think that the Eichlers themselves are actually, as a group, valuable as historic elements in our city. We've recognized that in one neighborhood already, and by slow attrition, we're getting Spanish-style uh, homes 
two stories with stucco, with um, tile roofs and so on, and that's diminishing the quality of the aesthetic in the neighborhood as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Michael Nuremberg will follow Diane Reckless. Hi, I'm Diane Reckless, and I've lived in an Eichler for almost 40 years now. And uh, this document was really well done. There's an awful lot of good stuff in it, but there's a, a leaning towards a, a standalone ADU, and I'm, I'll address just ADUs, the standalone versus attached, and in particular, the one in the rear. And for some reason, the ones in the rear, or the, the detached, could be 900 square feet. If it was part of the house, it'd have to be 600. Uh, if you take 900, most of our houses are about twice that. So you're taking half the size of a current Eichler and sticking it in the backyard. And even beyond that, if it's, the pictures make it look like a little playhouse. It's not, it's big. But uh, let me take you on a, a walk in my neighborhood, which is in a flood zone. So if you put a standalone, it has to start three or four feet up. And if you tried to get there in the backyard, you either have to walk past every single bedroom where kids are likely to be sleeping hmm. to get there, or you have to walk past three walls of glass or two walls of glass. And then you get to the backyard and you're sitting behind the master bedroom, which is another wall of glass. <clears throat> this doesn't seem like it's gonna be very nice. Those of you who haven't lived in an Eichler, please come spend some real quality time in an Eichler. Don't just walk through fast, but imagine what it would be like. Um, I think I really favor ADUs, but I hadn't c conceived until the middle of the night how big 900 square feet is. And uh, think through moving them into the front, not, not separate units, I don't think. They wouldn't fit in our house, <coughs> our neighborhood at least but attached ones could go very nicely. But do you'd have to move the setbacks in some cases, but within reason, that makes sense. Today's kids aren't there to play in the playground, or play in the front yard. We're not allowed to water the grass. So, or not allowed, we shouldn't. So setbacks don't make as much sense as they did 60 years ago. Make them smaller, make the houses make sense, and please really make the uh, backyard ones not very logical in most neighborhoods. Thank you. Great, thank you for those comments. All right, Marco, Mark, Michael Nuremberg. Yes, uh, Ming Zhao will be uh, follow. Okay, I'm Michael Nuremberg, and um, I've lived in Eichler for over 40 years. We've remodeled three times and put on a second story, all commensurate with the neighborhood, okay, the design, and basically kept it as an Eichler with those changes. So I'm actually here altruistically. This doesn't apply to me anymore. But I'm concerned because I really think the study and the process is tremendously flawed. There are 2,700 Eichlers in Palo Alto. The people who uh, constructed the paperwork have basically interviewed 150. Of the three meetings, okay, only 90 people have attended those. And of, now I didn't see the latest emails, but I reviewed every 233 emails prior to this. Only 27 people sent those in. So I don't think this is adequate representation. And by the way, I've spoken to two major real estate people in Palo Alto who never even heard what was going on. So despite the fact that this has supposedly been publicized, I totally disagree. More importantly, I think freezing the Eichlers in time really can have a potential problem. As new materials come along, new looks and things, we might be missing out on siding, roofing, things that actually can make our homes better, not worse, as we've done in our case. There's also a statement this is not about a single story overlay, and yet on page 90, let's see, 74, there's a picture of two Eichlers with a line going across them and something above it on the structure, which obviously is saying we are talking about a single structure overlay, so make no bones about it. We've also heard that this is voluntary ad nauseum. It is not. There is a three-tiered process in your notes how this can actually become something that the city can mandate and dictate. And I really think that's a problem. Not here to address second story or single story overlay, but I will say there are many multi-generational families that are now being prejudicially left out of these communities. They can't live in Eichlers. 
And I do want to remind you, there is something called the anti-NIMBY law, which I think was passed in California in 1982, where you can't discriminate against neighborhoods in, order, in terms of moving forward with development. It seems to me that this skirts that pretty closely, and there have already been two suits, Lafayette and Berkeley, that have been lost. So I would like to see us put our money in other things rather than this and not be in court over these things if they do become regulations. So my concern truly is I'm not sure there's been enough publicity, enough transparency. If the community truly wants to free cyclers in time, I'm totally with that. But I don't think that's the case. I also think that's wrong to do. So thank you for listening. Thank you for those comments, uh, Ming Zhao, followed by uh, Dr. Mandal. Mandal, pardon me for mispronouncing that. Hi, my name is <clears throat> my name is Ming Zhao. I live in uh, Eichler House. Uh, I'd like to concur with the previous, what the previous gentleman said. I don't think it's the right thing to phrase uh, Eichler in time. Especially, I, I mean, I like certain design aspects of the Eichler house, but I really don't like the certain choices made by Eichler. For example, the flat roof. Um, it might be good in look, but it doesn't really, uh, it really costs a lot for long term, long time maintenance because of lack of uh, adequate space. For example, last year I had to do some remodeling for my house. I had to open the roof because there was no other way to run the electrical lines to add some lights. Because the roof was open, I had to re-roof. And because we have the pipes running on the roof, because there was another, uh, no other place to run the pipes other than digging in the ground. So, but the roofer told me that we have to remove the pipes before they apply the, before they can re-roof. And then after the roof is down, they have to add the pipes back, which cost me about 5000 for adding nothing to the house, just to, to the re-roof, re -roof. because it's an Eichler house. So that's this kind of hidden cost that's kind of been um, inherited from this shortcut that was taken when this original house was made. Um, I think this. I don't think we should try to mandate certain design choices just because some people like that or some people don't like that. Um, other than that, I, um, I don't have other, um, other additional opinion other than what the previous gentleman, Michael, said. I really appreciate his uh, comments. Thanks. Thanks for your effort. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mandel followed by Sunita Verma. Good morning, everyone. My name is Manas Mandal. I'm a homeowner in Fairmeadow Tract. I've been reading these guidelines since, uh, I think, October, November, and they seem to have changed. On page 26, there's a big section called CCNRs. It says, this ICLA neighborhood guideline document supports and expands upon ICLA Tract CCNRs that are appropriate. Excuse me, yeah, can you, Sorry. Can, yeah, thank you. On page 26 of the document of the final draft, it says the Eichler Neighborhood Design Guidelines document supports and expands upon the Eichler Track CCNRs where appropriate and in adherence to the current city planning code. In Appendix A, Turnwell and Page described in detail how they went through and found these Eichler tracks. And they describe the CCNRs, but there's no evidence that CCNRs even exist. So I began digging into it. So I asked Director French, like, do we have any CCNRs in file? So Dr. Director French told me that they're aware of at least three CCNRs, or more than three CCNRs, and, uh, and of course, you know, I believe her. But I, when I bought my family to house in, 19, in 2005, my title did not have any CCNRs. So I began digging into the CCNR. One of the previous gentlemen described the failed SSO from Fairmeadow, and that document by Kathy Marks referred to a 1951 CCNR. But after proper research, I found a 1952 CCNR signed not by Eichler Homes, but by the San Jose Abstract and Title Company, dated 7 June 1952, stating the following. 
it is expressly, expressly agreed that the said declaration of CCNRs are terminated as to and do not apply to or in any way affect Fair Meadow. There is no CCNR in Fair Meadow. So for 66 years, Fair Meadow has lived free and clear of any restrictions, of any CCNRs. And after 66 <clears throat> years of freedom, suddenly there's a document which claims to put new guidelines. It doesn't make sense. The law has already given individual rights to the homeowners of Fair Meadow that they are free. These rules, if they're voluntary, they need to stay voluntary. There should be no discussion. There should be no slides presented saying that there could be a three-step process. There should be no regulatory attempt at all. And if only three CCNRs or four CCNRs exist, we should change this document and say that out of the 32 tracks, only four of them should be using the guidelines. The rest of them, because they're free, should not be subject to any guidelines. Let the individuals have their rights. There is no point of having overreach. A new FAQ was added, which states the following. This is on page, sorry, I'm looking at it, page 14. It says that, excuse me, we're three minutes. Okay, so, so it says the so IR guidelines will be used by the planning staff. I think it's unnecessary. The IR staff does not need any extra information because these are voluntary. Why on earth should the IR staff? So please remove all the overreaching document, uh, statements from the document. There's just too much overreach. It is unnecessary. Give us the freedom to live our lives. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Sunita Verma followed by Margaret Murphy. Hi, my name is Sunita Verma. I live in Ross Road in a two-story Eichler house since 2004. And like the gentleman said, we haven't had enough. I got this on Tuesday night. And the meeting is this morning. I don't know, you can see how many people are not here who would like to speak. That's not very much notice. We need, if you want input from the citizens, you need to give us more notice. We can't just show up and step from work and come show up here at 8.30 in the morning. There should be different meeting at different times, and the notice should be at least two weeks, if not longer. And like, like I mentioned, I live on Ross Road. There's a lot of stuff going on there that we were never notified, but that's a different method. But I wanna say, if there already guidelines exist, I live right next door to a one-store single house and I've talked to my neighbors and we have no privacy issues. Our house is two story, the one next to us is two story, on the other side, they're not. So if there are guidelines already existing to protect those for privacy and the other thing, why do we need to spend more money from the city to make more guidelines if they already exist? Let's take that money and use it for something else that we need for our city, for our teenagers or the youth who need something, some place to go, to go hang out. There's nothing for the youth to hang out. There's no places for them to go hang except the mall or the downtown. Let's save our money for the other issues that are more important than spending money that's something that already exists. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, Margaret Murphy, and I think there's one other, is there, are there any more cards there? My name is Margaret Murphy. I received this notice yesterday. I would like to say that I live in an Eichler on Lewis Road. And I would like to say that I concur with the comment regarding notice. This is an issue that is very important to me. It is very important to my neighbors. We were not given due notice. Please provide more notice. Of course, we will provide comments in email and in other forms. I do not believe that this was correct. Um, I would also like to concur with Michael and the others who have said that, there, that this study perhaps was not broad enough, did not include enough examples. There are so many Eichlers, so many different experiences in this city. I think that you have a unique opportunity to do more in this area. I concur with my colleague who just spoke about use of time and use of money. However, I disagree. I do think that this affects many, many people in this city in many different ways. And I encourage you to look for solutions that include homeowners who've been here for a very long time and like their neighborhoods the way that they are 
as well as newer homeowners and their concerns. I ask you to look at this seriously and not abandon this, and I think that you've made some steps in the right direction, but I encourage you to continue and to get broader input. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, last card I have is from Sheila Chang. Um, my name is Sheila Chen. I live in my Akala home 30 years. Faced the uh, Ajibu Shopping Center more. And uh, I will say, you know, I, I come here just listen, and now I have some comment. The first one I like to say, they mentioned about CCNR. My house have a two story, and then they built the second story, 1964. My house was built 1954. The track say, that area is 1956. Actually, mine is 54. So 1964, they built the second story of my previous owner. And then we bought that already be 30 years. So that means what the CCNR. And a uh, couple years ago, many, I can't remember, our member, we teamed up against Age of Wood Shopping Center, new owner, because couple of reasons. The first, because they build a low income housing and a big market, and juvenile school doesn't want more low income kids. So they say, well, we overflow. And then, and then my neighbor, they have a, a team say, oh, this is Aikla. Oh, uh, they're going to flood into our area. See, we better sign. So I signed. I let them come over my place, giving us uh, drink and then I sign the paper. And we do a lot of things, try to against, uh, to damage Icola. But actually, I'm glad we don't have this, our, you know, like overlay, you can build the second story in that area. Because Icola is very old, structure is not very stable for two story, and also not very good for some kind of you know, like a termite, something like that. You ask me, do I like Icla? Yes. Do I appreciate this? I will say yes, because I follow Sunnyvale when I say, oh, awesome, they have a guideline. Palo Alto not have no guideline. We have a guideline. That's wonderful. But I'm not saying I have to start, stop and say, don't do anything, you know, I have to keep this one. And the, Worst foundation, and, and a lot of things is not insulated properly. And then I, mean, I will say thank you very much to make this a skyline option. And also, I don't believe CCNR, everybody follow that because they really want to keep that style, keep everything as it is. We abuse all CCNR back to the day I call our builder. They made that. Okay, that's just my experience, 30 years. Thank you. Thank you uh, for those comments, and thank all of you who've come today. We hardly ever have an audience, and uh, I think all of the input that, that, um, that you have provided is useful. So let's um, take this back to the board for Discussion. I guess we'll close the public hearing portion of this. We can reopen it again if we need to. Uh, board members, uh, comments, questions? Martin. Uh, thank you, Chair Bauer. And um, uh, I'd like to first of all thank uh, Amy and her staff for the, um, the email blasts that have been uh, going out to the neighborhood. So thanks for that. I know there's been uh, um, requests from uh, neighbors to uh, say what's going on. And uh, so thanks for your good response on that. Appreciate it. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, members of the public who spoke about uh, getting a notice only one or two days earlier, um, uh, but I think you s things were sent out more than one or two days ago. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Um, we, um, this is the first time that we've uh, sent notice to all of the Eichler uh, addresses in the city. Um, so you know, to that extent, yes, we have not been sending them out for the last year to every single Eichler address. So this is the first time, and we were able to get you know the work behind that to get all the addresses and send that out. Um, 
but it wasn't two days ago. Um, perhaps the holidays. Um, yeah, it's not a requirement. It's a courtesy um, flyer that we've sent out. Um, again, these are not voluntary. These are voluntary, not mandatory. So there's no obligation to send out. We've done what we could. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that response. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, board uh, uh, and chair Bauer, I have. Uh, I went through all of the um, uh, in the orange markup ones. I went page by page, and I, I comments on the different pages, and each comment will result in also a question for for staff. Okay, uh, go through. Right. That's what we're here for. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just going to go each. Uh, I, I went through um, the orange markup page here, and then because those that's new new wording, <clears throat> and I'll just uh, start with the questions here, um, and I'm just going to go right to the sequence here. Uh, I'll say the page numbers if, for reference. So page number uh, 13 on the uh, right hand side. It says, uh, the guidelines are designed to help the City of Palo Alto's planning and community environment staff and review bodies in determining the appropriateness of the, the proposed work. My question were about determining appropriateness. Does that mean if the uh, planning department uh, decides that it's not appropriate, does that mean a applicant then could not proceed with a building permit? So, this is a general statement and, um, you know, where a national register district um, or single story overlay district is, is imposed or is already placed on uh, one of these tracks, um, you know, it could be a conversation, but no, there's no, nothing mandatory about, uh, about this. It's, it's a broad statement. Um, it's not intended to be uh, punitive or mandatory. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, then um, let's see. And then um, next page uh, 14. Uh, on the right, on the left hand side, it says uh, the guidelines are currently voluntary, just as, as you mentioned also. Um, um, and then it also says on that left hand side, so uh, the purpose of this is offered advice. That's a, that's a great thing. Uh, education is is, is fantastic. Um, the, uh, the middle, it does say, um, the question says, uh, my home is not an Eichler, but I live across the street uh, with an Eichler. Will I be subject to design guidelines? And the uh, author of the, this document says, possibly. Um, so that still leaves uh, some question and some doubt for an applicant who's trying to make uh, concrete decisions. Um, uh, and Paul goes on to say, however, your, while your home may not be an Eichler, it may be within. So, um, so the fact that things are voluntary, I think, is uh, um, when things they say possibly in May, again, it's from someone who's trying to say, well, am I affected or not? The, the language of this may be um, um, uh, not so clear. Okay. Yes, actually, I, um, Martin, thank you for that. I, um, you know, am looking at this as well and saying that uh, on the first part about the, um, about are they mandatory? How, it does say the guidelines will be used concurrently with the individual review guidelines. Um, that, that could not uh, take place in, unless um, until the council adopts an ordinance that connects these guidelines to the individual review process for two-story homes. Right so, um, so we will need to change these before these go to council to clarify that they, you know, only, you know, in every case, right. only by council adoption of an ordinance will these be in any way utilized by staff um, for review. Okay, thank you. Uh, page 18, uh, the right-hand side, it talks about, um, uh, it says, for example, residents and homeowners and properties in Green Meadow, Gables National Register Historic Districts may, con may consider a stricter interpretation of the, of the guidance. Um, that would take the uh, property owner initiative for that to become um, uh, stricter interpretation um, for it to become, because it's right now it's not mandatory. So uh, property owner initiative is required before uh, uh, any of these things become um, uh, more strict. That's just, just a comment. Okay. Right, so in the, in the event that there are CCNRs and the neighborhood is, um, does have an architectural control committee, I'm only aware of two of those in the city, 
um, they, they could uh, choose, it's voluntary again, but right. to utilize these guidelines for those neighborhoods. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, page uh, 21 talks about individual review process. And uh, the ordinance says uh, that's only involved in uh, second story additions of a certain scope. And the uh, IR also focuses on privacy, scale, massing, and streetscape. It's fine. That's, that's good. Process. That's a good process for for that. Um, when I read the uh, 132 or 232 comment, it seems like the um, the dominant theme was the idea of privacy. So individual review, I think, uh, already addresses that issue. Um, so that's already taken care of, I believe, the the, the idea of privacy. Uh, one of the uh, members of the public uh, mentioned about. Uh, uh, a one story and, and, and the idea of the question of privacy. I'm imagining, say, uh, the, if, say if the, flo the floor level has to be raised to uh, three feet because of flood zone requirements. Um, uh, so that puts someone's eyes at eight feet above the ground. Um, for privacy, you can have a six foot fence and then you can still do a 20, 24 inch uh, uh, decorative thing above that. So actually, you can have a fence that's also at eight feet high. So um, uh, for one story, um, I hear issues of privacy, but one story, the privacy is already solved by a fence, I believe, because you can only, if the eye level is at eight feet. And, anyway. So um, I think privacy is already addressed. Um, so I just heard a lot of those comments from the public. So just my comment that I think privacy is already addressed in the ordinance. So uh, IR actually, I'd say, uh, um, speaking through the uh, chair, the, um, um, uh, the IR does address privacy issues already and uh, window locations and all that. So I think uh, privacy is already addressed through the ordinances. Okay. Uh, next is uh, page uh, 27 on the uh, left-hand side. Talks about uh, properties eligible for listing in the National Register. Uh, my three questions are, um, let's see, uh, the question I wrote down was, are, are any Eichler homes uh, shown on page 25? Those are all the Eichler tracks. Are any of those a listed local historic resource? Are any of you, okay. And I think the answer is no, there's no. no, yeah. So there's no historic resource, so therefore, um, uh, any uh, protection of, or uh, regulation that may involve the Historic Resources Board or the Historic Preservation Ordinance, that, none, that ordinance will not apply to any of these buildings because none of them are listed as individuals. Correct. Right? Yeah. The HRB and historic review process does not apply to National Register Eichler districts in this right, yeah. city because they are not listed on our local inventory. Okay. Right. Okay, so the HRB would never ever see any any proposal that comes any change to historic building or any change to an Eichler building would never come to the Historic Resources Board. Yeah. Right. It, and it just so happens, I'll just say this, yeah. um, that the two National Register districts um, are both single-story overlays, so there is never going to be a discretionary review, um, a, you know, two-story home proposed in 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 one of those oh, districts. Okay. Fine, good, okay. All right, good, thank you. Um, going back to one of the other comments that I think two members of the public made about uh, the idea of historic preservation and uh, uh, I think the phrase was uh, frozen in time. So we do have uh, at least one project or one building in Palo Alto that is frozen in time that the community has certainly embraced it to be frozen in time. That's the Hewlett Packard garage. Um, it's down to the original nails are still there. Um, so there's an example of uh, historic preservation where it's frozen in time, so that's, that's certainly appropriate. Um, the, uh, uh, a couple of members of the public mentioned about uh, yeah, not having their Eichler homes considered to be frozen in time. Um, I just wanna make one quick comment about uh, what is historic about some of these neighborhoods? And uh, I think one of the historic issues is from a social point of view, from the say 1950s, it was common to have uh, extended families living in in these homes, um, meaning you needed meaning you needed uh, square footage. 
Um, so any restriction to say a house can, has to be frozen in time uh, is, can become pretty restrictive. And um, uh, again, it's, we've heard many applicants come before our board that you know, the reason we want to expand any house is that uh, for multi-generational. So um, uh, not having it frozen in time, I'm, I'm, I support that idea of not having uh, uh, that, not having an Eichler house be um, uh, frozen in time. So, okay, thank you for that. Um, a few more, I apologize, but again, we just got this information also. Yeah. Should, should I set the three minute timer? <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, page uh, 28 talks about preservation incentives. Um, um, as you've heard me speak publicly, I'm in a huge favor of uh, preservation incentives. Um, uh, there's also talk about the uh, historic uh, building code. Uh, so can a house not listed in, in the local register use the California historic? So all these uh, homes that are um, in um, um, national register districts, can they use the California historic building code? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. All right. The um, page 29 uh, says that my question I wrote here was, um, oh, before, I guess that, that's continuing my, that same question. Uh, before, uh, oh, be, it says on page uh, 29 on the left-hand side, a building may qualify as a historic resource if it falls within one of these categories. But again, I guess then that's the uh, requirement of the property owner to actually re um, apply for historic status before any um, uh, uh, historic uh, benefits can, uh, can accrue. So, okay. We've already heard uh, today that uh, yeah, there's no, no Eichler building is on the historical register. So, okay. Almost done here. Um, already made the comment about the, the individual review process uh, uh, response to privacy. Um, one of the guidelines on page 67, it does show horizontal or vertical um, siting, so that's good that there's flexibility on that. Getting toward the end. Um, page uh, 73, uh, is there any prohibition on a Eichler house being demolished? Um, so once it's a building permit for uh, replacement building, is, is there any uh, prohibition on Eichler House being demolished. I don't think there is. No, again, because none of our Eichlers, um, even those in the National Register District, are, are on our inventory locally. Okay. So therefore, demolition is allowed. Um, that We do have a rule in Palo Alto that you have to have a replacement home because okay. we don't want to have disappearing our housing stock, um, you know, and for other reasons. Uh, <laughs> So maximum lot size, et cetera. Sure, great. Thank you for that. Page 74, uh, I see the word on the left-hand side. There's a word uh, perceived height. I'm a huge uh, proponent of that idea that uh, uh, it's not so much how high something is, but what's the perception, and that's where the IR, view, IR process can get involved in. And three more co comments here. Uh, page 107, special considerations for National Historic District. Um, uh, we've heard uh, presenters f representative of the architectural co control committees for the different neighborhoods. Um, I, my hat's off to them. I think they do a, a pretty fantastic job in, in helping um, uh, speak to and educate and hear um, different points of view about uh, what uh, is deemed by that committee and perhaps in another neighborhood representatives, what's appropriate for that neighborhood. So it sounds like there is some architectural control already in, in effect. Uh, I, I know the city of Palo Alto does not get involved in those uh, private conversations, but it looks like there is some uh, good care put into those architectural control committees. So that's a good, good way for them, plus with any of these uh, voluntary design guidelines, I think that's a good educational aspect here. 
page 109, I'm glad to see the uh, comment about the doorknobs being put in. If accessibility is a concern, consider a lever, level, a lever handle with a simple unornamental contemporary look. I'm glad for that uh, clarification. Okay. Uh, I do see on page 110, and this will be my last comment, about uh, on the right-hand side, it says the two existing national registered districts, Green Meadow and Green Meadows, also have S uh, single story overlay status. Then it says, however, second story additions are not encouraged in any historic district that may be designated in the future as a measure to retain the integrity of the district. Uh, I will suggest that uh, two story, a second story, um, uh, there, there probably are designs that could be uh, added and still maintain the uh, integrity of the district. It would need to be a, obviously a very sensitive addition. Uh, again, we have the IR process and then other um, re reviews that um, can be done for that. So those are my uh, comments based on the comments uh, uh, we were received in, in orange. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for doing a detailed uh, review of this document. Um, Roger, you have any comments? Okay. Oh, Emily, right. please. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. Everyone, uh, just to speak to your earlier comment, uh, Chair Member Bernstein, about the California Historic Building Code. Uh, just to clarify in that, the uh, California Historic Building Code is, um, provides alternative building regulations when dealing with qualified historic resources. And a qualified historic resource is any um, existing or future uh, resource uh, listed on a local, state, or national register. So the contributing resources within those two national registered districts would certainly be considered uh, qualified historic resources, so, so they could take advantage of the, the historic building code. The only thing to note is that since they are not on the local uh, register, which we, we discussed, the local inventory, that they could not take advantage of other incentives offered. So following up on that, mm -hmm. um, we have discussed whether or not, uh, we have discussed the, um, floodplain issue um, as it relates to historic properties. And could you just for put into the record here how that applies? I think if I remember correctly, the flood zone, uh, if the building is a recognized historic building, then the flood zone regulations are suspended or don't apply? Yes, it's something along those lines dealing with FEMA and the federal uh, flood insurance program where historic resources could be exempt from certain restrictions on uh, basements in flood zone. So just so it's clear, as I understand this, if you have an historic resource, as your building is, is designated or recognized as an historic resource, the need to comply with a raised first floor elevation above floodplain would not um, uh, apply. Is that correct? I believe that's the interpretation. But again, that's, like we said, just for qualified historic resources. So that wouldn't be true for all Eichlers. It would just be for the ones within the two uh, National Register districts. So the reason I bring this up is if for the two nationally recognized districts, were they to be added to the city's um, inventory, which I have said publicly many times, I think sh uh, that they should be added, then the floodplain issues, which relate directly to the privacy issues that many people have spoken to both today and in public comments, are somewhat mitigated because you're not gonna have those uh, differentiated elevations. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just going to go across the, the board here. Um, Margaret, any comments? Um, yeah, I was um, just listening very carefully to all the public comments and um, trying to really understand um, some of your sentiments and thoughts. And it, it sounded like there was a mix of people who were in support and some people who were maybe not maybe feeling a little threatened by the guidelines that maybe would preempt them from doing some things that they would ultimately want to do. Um, I think, um, and especially um, responding to the ADU comments, so I think there are some cases where the city puts out these guidelines for, for, for instance, for, for the ADU um, 
new ordinance that we have. And sometimes those uh, regulations or those parameters might not be applicable to, for instance, an Eichler uh, house that you feel like the 900 square feet is too big for the backyard. So I think those people who own Eichler properties, they would have to find a balance themselves in what's appropriate for their for their unique um, site, their unique property, their unique um, situation, and, and, and adapt those available uh, ADU ordinances for them. For them, I think putting um, an ADU in the front yard would probably be disruptive of the overall neighborhood character. So um, I think, I guess, what I'm trying to say is that the there are these ordinances that are out there that not, not may not specifically apply to your unique individual property. So I think it's up to the property owners to interpret what is appropriate for their own for their own well-being, for their own property. Um, I think also, um, in terms of the CCNRs, I hadn't really, um, I, ha I wasn't really aware of a lot of the CCNRs that might have existed when these Eichler neighborhoods originated. But I think that these guidelines, we sh they're not necessarily um, a replacement or they're not necessarily meant to be a new CCNR. The, these guidelines are in response to the fact that these Eichler neighborhoods are becoming historic um, because of their age and because of they've been around for a significant amount of time that the city wants to preserve that uh, mid-century modern um, architectural style that is prevalent in, in Palo Alto. So these guidelines are an effort to preserve and to guide the preservation of these neighborhoods, um, not necessarily meant f as a replacement or um, a new CCNR that is is suddenly imposed upon you. Um, so those are my two comments. Thank you. Michael, any additions? Well, there was, uh, I can't recall what page it was on, but there was some discussion about uh, if this goes to council, a three-tier approach. I, I think that... Uh, it's coming up. Yeah. I want I want to discuss that okay. after we've made comments. But it, I, th I think that uh, has a, a lot of people concerned that this is becoming a requirement, uh, and it's not just a voluntary type acti activity that we're promoting. So I think there's some real concerns with the public when they see this. That yeah, we're calling it voluntary, but is it really voluntary? So I think there's a feeling of, uh, I won't call it a threat, but some feeling that they may be uh, more than what we've advertised as voluntary. Okay, um, you want any comments? Ro Roger. Well, I'd just like to comment that the um, group of folks here today, and there's, there are a lot of different comments expressed by all the different people, and. It's what towns are made of, a whole bunch of different people. <laughs> so um, there were some and spoke today very adamant about they wanted a certain way, others didn't care, others were annoyed that they would have to worry about this. And so it's a very interesting um, group. And uh, uh, we on the board here just try to do the best we can within what we hear from homeowners and staff and ourselves. It's very, uh, in fact, I'm just, Curious if you could maybe just state the purpose of today's meeting, just out of just out of my, so I can re readjust my what I've heard and what we're sure. The purpose of today's meeting uh, is to um, receive a recommendation from the HRB on these guidelines. Um, this is we've been at this for a little while. You have um, you know we, you continue this from January 25th to this date, um, so that um, you could see the modifications done um, by our consultant following the comments you made on January 25th and following the comments made at the public workshop on January 18th um, and the, the emails that we received through our Eichler um, inbox um, that you have all received at places on January 25th and in this staff report. So uh, the goal is to f finish with the HRB then we start the um, exciting process of re-notifying the neighborhood and seeing which agenda this will land on with the council. Currently, we've targeted April 2nd. 
um, you know, and we'll see what happens with, uh, you know, emails to council and all of this, you know, the, the, once it gets closer to council, then people really come out of the woodwork, even if we've been at it for a year. Um, this is kind of the, what we're talking about, this booklet, which becomes the guiding light for everybody when talking about um, ICOR neighborhoods. And I assume it's, there are neighborhoods, because there's several, all kinds of groups of ICORs around town, right? There's a map inside the guidelines yeah, that shows yeah. all of the ICOR tracks. Yeah. It's okay. not just the big one on Alma. It's no. lots of other, yeah. Okay. So um, I'd like to make a few comments and then we'll move towards um, crafting a motion. As I, uh, first of all, I went to the first public meeting. I couldn't attend the other two. But it was pretty clear that the community members that did go to those meetings had two primary concerns. and and reviewing the 236 comments that are part of our package today, those concerns popped up to the top. And, and the number one concern is uh, the issue of privacy with additions that would provide direct line of sight into other, you know, from a new project into an existing house. And that ties in with the second most commented on um, issue, which is second story additions. They are really one and the same um, issue I think that this, these guidelines, as in the, this final form that we have here today, and I don't, by the way, mean to suggest that this is the last time these guidelines are going to be addressed, because guidelines are, I think, of uh, guidelines as dynamic, and they, they do change. So um, while I don't think these are the perfect approach, I think these are a good start. And as we saw from Professorville guidelines, those guidelines helped inform these guidelines in ways that I think make both of them better. Um, the next item that um, was of concern to people who wrote in is how these guidelines will be enforced. And those concerns um, are focused on property values, on flexibility of design changes, um, how new property, new development will impact their existing houses. Uh, my experience in the seminars that I've attended that actually apply directly to this have um, informed me that formation of historic districts actually increases the value of property. And Los Angeles did a 10-year study of this and developed a very comprehensive ordinance, much more um, thorough and uh, restrictive, I think, in a sense, than our guidelines, and found that in every case, the property values in those areas increased. The thing that they discovered was that if you are in a district, like an Eichler district, and Los Angeles has different districts, and some developer came in and bought a property next to you, tore down the, a, a house that conforms to the district style, and then built something totally different. The property values next door to those on either side and across the street all went down because of the new development. And they were, they were frankly surprised at that and surprised that when these overlays went, went into effect in Los Angeles, they raised the values of the properties. And not, you know, obviously everything in California is now more expensive, but what really was significant is they, could, they demonstrated that that was a real value. So I think these have, these guidelines, and again, these are guidelines which are intended to set expectations about development. They don't, they don't demand a certain style, but they inform the designers who are gonna be working in these, in these neighborhoods, and they are different neighborhoods, about what is expected to, uh, in the new designs, to conform or to complement, and there are lots of other historic um, preservation words that we use, but basically to complement what's already there. And I'm, my colleagues on the board who are architects and designers, I'm sure would never 
want to design a project that wasn't conforming to and complementary to a um, historic district. But this is an attempt to really help both the new, the, the new development ideas and the existing um, architecture to live in, in some harmony. Um, I think it's important for the community to understand that historic district designation again provides lots of benefits. People I think are afraid of that, that sort of designation because they think it limits their options. I think um, from a, a, a 40 year career as a building contractor in this community that had I known about the historic, if we had the historic building code, that it would have been much easier to do a number of projects that I built, um, but they weren't, it wasn't available. So there are incentives in this document that help us move, I think, the conversation away from limiting property values, but instead enhancing them, enhancing community. And by the way, Eichler's, as all buildings are, they are a living document of our history. And people who live in them don't necessarily I, I think they live in them because they like the design, maybe it's affordable, but most important, they're preserving what, what Palo Alto was 50, 60 years ago, just like we're preserving the Hewlett Packard garage because that's something that was very important to our development here. Um, almost done. Uh, I think this, I, I'm hoping this, these guidelines are a first step in helping to inform the community and I fully expect that there will be a vigorous discussion at council because there always is when these kinds of things are adopted. So I want the board to turn to page 56 in our packet, which has the um, four, I'm sorry we don't have this up on the, on the um, screen so members of the audience can participate. This is attachment B in our packet. It is the regulatory, uh, it, it is uh, a path forward um, yeah, it's 56 down in the right hand corner of our packet. It's attachment B, I don't know if you can get to that. Well, M Amy can get it up on the screen so everyone, there it is, I see it. So I'd like the board to focus on how we, uh, when we create a motion, how we can um, direct council or not direct them, but simply inform them about how we feel they should move forward. There are four options, tier zero, one, two, and three. And just to review them, zero is nothing, do nothing. Uh, tier one is uh, an individual review integration and privacy, uh, and privacy guidelines, and you can see that that's adopting ordinances using in tandem, using this in tandem with IR uh, review. Tier two is a voluntary Eichler, Eichler overlay district, as is, as is um, uh, described here as EO, which is Eichler overlay. So you create a district similar to single story overlay districts, and then you'd use an entire document this entire document or a portion of it um, as it, uh, applying it to new homes or secondary additions. Also address erosion of support for single story overlay and the Eichler um, thing. And then the tier three option is regulatory options which is develop standards, enhance for privacy, height, size, setback, second stories, give legal certainty with maximums for discretionary applications and then for use with other regulatory discretion process. So I'd like the board to um, move to actually include one or m more of these tiers in our recommendation to the council. Is there um, discussion? Martin. Thank you, uh, Chair Bauer. I'd like to uh, tag on to your comment about the um, uh, historic districts and the value uh, that that has been to um, property owners. Uh, uh, so. To any uh, members of the public who have said um, uh, they're concerned about uh, a, a replacement house being a non eichler uh, compatible building. Um, so there is no, and in the IR guidelines, there are, there's no requirement 
of style. It's only for massing and, and, and scale and privacy issues. Um, Taking on to uh, Chair Bauer's comment about um, districts, um, just as neighborhood, two neighborhoods have gotten together enough uh, support to apply for and get granted a national historic district, um, that's I think a, a great step toward uh, any um, uh, regulations tied with uh, incentives of, uh, of what to do for modifying or building a new house. So. Uh, um, uh, we've seen great success in the Professorville District, for example, where you know, property values are pretty incredible there. Um, and there are, uh, uh, for many of the homes there, there's like, I think about you know, 11 different incentives that property owners can uh, em employ um, to actually uh, do things that bottom line actually increase the value of the property and still maintain the district. So I would encourage um, uh, any of Eichler neighborhoods, uh, if they, um, uh, you know, are concerned about well, what's the uh, uh, the design sense of the neighborhood uh, to uh, consider uh, applying for uh, national districts too, because then the incentives then can it's a lot easier for incentives to be applied. So that's a good way for uh, neighborhood uh, preservation. Okay. This that's just my comment, just to support that idea. Sorry, um, let me ask staff. There is a, a resolution, a draft resolution. Or should we be commenting on that? Page um, 53 in our packet. Yes, it's prepared um, so that you can, uh, you know, weigh in on um, the wording there. Um, this is coming to the council to describe. Um, you know, I mean, basically, it gives a little history, the fact that uh, we were directed to do this by council. They decided to spend their money on it, you know, over a year ago, to almost two years ago now. Uh, well, December of 2016, they authorized um, us to proceed with a contract to do exactly what we've done. Um, it then gives a bit of a history. It talks about the, um, the comprehensive plan policies. Um, there in, in that section H, um, which are findings basically to talk about, um, in, you know, policy L1.1, for instance, ensure that new or remodeled structures are compatible with the neighborhood and adjacent structures. That's, a, that's an existing comprehensive plan policy. And there are at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more policies referenced. This is the new comprehensive plan that was adopted by council in November, became effective in December. Um, and then there's a finding there about being consistent and compatible with the applicable purposes of the R1 zone. Um, so there's three bullets there. So if you wanna take a moment to read those and uh, let us know if there's um, any issue with those statements related to what we're doing here, that'd be great. Uh, Chair, I've got one question. Does this, um not a proclamation, a resolution, um, proposed resolution. Does it tie into any of the, of the tier zero, one, two, or three, do you know? It does not. Okay. It is designed to be specifically about the guidelines alone as a document, um, as a voluntary document. Okay. Um, what would go to council, we're targeting April 2nd at this point, um, would be, again, this same chart that you're seeing here to give the flavor of options, tiers zero through three, there would be no ordinance um, going to council in April. They would have to direct staff to go and write an ordinance to come back to make it um, effectively useful with the individual review for two-story homes or any other potential options. If they want us to come back with a Eichler overlay uh, option for people in neighbor those neighborhoods to volunteer to be, uh, you know, to, to, to get together and elect themselves uh, select themselves, uh, then th then that would happen at that point. So that's another year in the making, I think. Thank you. So I'd like to do two, I wanna split these up. I wanna consider, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Councilwoman Holman. I, I just wanna say a couple of things for, um, for the public is, um, going back to the genesis of these guidelines, how it came about wasn't because staff or the council were looking for more work. This, these came about because a good number of people got together who live in Eichler neighborhoods uh, and wanted some, wanted some guidance and some assist by the city 
to help preserve their neighborhoods. And it wasn't about, uh, to borrow somebody's term, it wasn't about freezing anything in time, but it was a, a concerns about um, the kinds of development additions, new, new construction that was happening in their Eichler neighborhoods. Um, so this, this came out, this was a grassroots effort that brought this to the council's attention that caused this effort to happen. So that's the springboard from which this, from which this came. The other thing, um, I'm, as I've been on the council now for this is my ninth year and on planning commission for eight and a half years before that, um, I hope people will look at this with two minds. Um, there are people who are very supportive of these and they're not perfect. I don't agree with everything in them. It's not, nobody's gonna be 100% satisfied. But look at these with two minds. So um, these could be um, very helpful in precluding the reason I mentioned the 17 years I've been doing this, because there are appeals that come out of people not having guidance like this in front of them and provided. So we have neighbors fighting neighbors and neighbors and neighbors fighting neighbors and neighbors uh, because of new construction additions and such in these NICLA neighborhoods. I see these as a resource to help um, abate those, uh, those appeals and those battles within neighborhoods. Um, they are, I don't know what the council, full council is gonna do about some aspect of this being, um, uh, you know, an ordinance or all voluntary. At this point in time, they're all voluntary. Council will weigh in on that. The community will weigh in on that. But I hope people will look at these, like I say, with two minds of like trying to help neighborhoods stay neighborhoods. And I don't mean that just architectural, I mean it also in terms of relationship. So um, again, I'm hoping people can hold two minds with this and understand the genesis of this was from people who live uh, in uh, Eichler neighborhoods. And I think it also would be helpful if uh, staff could provide in conjunction with this to the public is what the um, information is that, because um, I think it is documented, the information that uh, Chair Bauer was providing about the value of historic neighborhoods, um, what it mean, means to be in a historic neighborhood. It isn't, it isn't a no change situation. Um, it's a being respectful uh, situation and providing guidance. And also to uh, provide what the incentives are that the city has for historic properties should, should any of these districts want to become, uh, be added to the, um, inventory or if other neighborhoods want to be uh, considered for addition. So I think the options and, and alternatives need to be provided from the various perspectives. Uh, and I appreciate very much the chair's comments. And I hope that's helpful to the public, hopefully. hopefully. Well, I think we all hope it's helpful for the public. So uh, thank you for that comment. I'd like to make one other comment just so that the homeowners who are here um, get a sense of perspective. I own a building in the Liberty Hill Historic District in San Francisco. That's a Victorian district. And our, the value of that property in the 10 years we've owned it has skyrocketed, not just because it's in San Francisco in the mission, but because the, the entire district is protected. So when builders, uh, actually developers, buy the buildings, and several of them very close to us have been purchased, they can't tear down the Victorians. They maintain the facades, which is really what, you know, we're, we're talking here about a facade issue. None of these guidelines talk, do address anything that goes on inside the building. And they don't, frankly, really regulate anything that goes, that any alterations that would occur on the outside of the side yard and the rear yards, with the exception of ADUs, and that's a whole different issue. So what we're talking about here is trying to maintain the front facade of these neighborhoods. I mean, obviously, you know, with additions. And, and so my Victorian building is not frozen in time. It is moder has been modernized to the maximum extent possible, but we've retained all of the features that made it attractive to us when we bought it and made the, the historic district a recognized space. So, I'm not just sitting up here 
as the chair of the committee saying we ought to do this stuff to, to my neighbors because I don't understand what goes on. I have a really good understanding of what historic districts do and the benefits, and they are substantial. So that said, uh, I'd like to talk, I'd like the board to consider, and by the way, I'm not the only person on this board that has uh, owns historic buildings. Um, Michael does, Martin does, and Beth Bunnenberg, who was on the board, also is in a building that could be considered historic, and uh, Corey does. So we all have different personal relationships with properties that have designations. So I want to talk about this attachment B because I'd like the board to um, consider this as one motion and I'd like to recommend a pathway for the council. I think that's what we, we can help the council evaluate their uh, and do their job if we can give them direction based on our experience here. So I don't want to, we're at 1010, I would like to try to move this along quickly so we can go back to work. Any comments? Let's, I'm going to just start at this end and come back. Michael? No comments? Okay. Margaret. Um, well, I definitely think that we wouldn't have gone through all of this effort and just had a tier zero. Um, I would think that we would want for this to be, I mean, not just go through all this work and have this, this very educational and helpful document and just put it on the shelf. I think that it should be uh, an interactive tool. So I think that we should at least have some, some step along the way where people have to um, respond or have to read or have to engage with this document while they're considering making any alterations or doing any modifications to their house. So maybe, um, I mean, I think, I always feel like you fall somewhere in the middle. You don't want to make it into an ordinance where it has to be followed to the T, which might be the tier three, but I think somewhere in the, in the middle where at least we're using it as a tool and a very, you know, and a very valid, useful tool. So I think somewhere in the middle is where we need to guide them. Okay, Roger. Well, I think the, not sure how to start this, but over the years, having been architecting here in Palo Alto over 40 years and worked on, I don't, you know, four or 500 houses in Palo Alto, um, this is a pretty, I think, a very important area. When I was in fourth grade, we moved here from New Jersey, and um, then we moved, but a lot of my friends lived in Icars because we were down on, uh, East, East Meadow, West Meadow Road. So I got a close spending not many, you know, nights that burying homes and uh, icors, and I kind of got used to how the, how that they were. And they're they're a special breed. They uh, have a lot of neat features and some annoying ones as well. Um, and so I think it's a well, well worthwhile goal to try to keep what we've got going and maintaining it and, and improving it, um, but not necessarily limiting everything to be the exact ICOR program, but that you're not interrupting what's there now that we're increasing or improving uh, the neighboring homes. So um, this is basically goals for the exterior of the home as seen from the street, as far as is what you've been telling us. and. Um, most folks who end up living in Icors like the inside of Icors. That's one reason they bought the house, because they really have a neat feature. Um, so I'm hoping we could get this, and I agree that we don't want to go with tier zero, and then we have the one, two, three options. Is that what yes, we're talking? That's, that's correct. Yeah, so what, David? What? Sorry, um, we could also uh, suggest a modification of these tiers. Okay. I don't think we have to adopt one, two, or uh, one, two, or three. I want to jump in and clarify again. You are not um, to to. We have not fleshed these out in in a oh. way that's recommendable at this time. Oh, I see. I, I would like the board to focus on the guidelines themselves, which are voluntary, and any changes there too, so we can take that specifically to the council. This possibility 
can be discussed, but let's not lose focus of what we're doing today, which is the guidelines okay, well, I adoption. Think that, uh, Martin did a, quite a good job on his little checklist and other comments, so I'm comfortable with whatever we're approving, I'm still not sure, but. We're recommending, recommending the guidelines okay. to the city council, yeah. and there's a resolution that can be tweaked if you okay. would care to look at that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Martin. Yes, I looked at the uh, resolution and uh, on page, uh, packet page 54, uh, policy L6.2. Um, I'll just read it for the public record. If a proposed project would substantially affect the exterior of a potential historic resource that has not been evaluated for inclusion into the city's historic resources inventory, city staff shall consider whether it is eligible for inclusion in state or federal registers prior to the issuance of a demolition or alterations permit. Um, again, this is a good uh, uh, resolution statement that uh, is in support of uh, historic neighborhood character, uh, which would encourage then neighborhoods who are concerned about that to apply for a historic district uh, designation. Um, I totally agree with uh, Chair Bauer about the, uh, uh, boy, the, his, the uh, cultural value and by the way, his uh, um, financial value of historic districts and the preservations. Um, I've done about 12 homes in Professorville where we use these incentives, um, uh, really expanded the, um, market value for one for one way and also maintain the uh, character of the district too. So um, uh, uh, any neighborhoods that are caring about uh, their neighborhood character, well, I think historic designation is a good way to go. So I would encourage owners to um, uh, think about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I don't wanna make this um, attachment be the, the primary focus, but I'm, um, I'm not hearing any board member suggest that these guidelines as they've been presented today shouldn't be um, forwarded to the council for adoption in some way into our city ordinance. And the reason I wanted to focus on this attachment is that I think um, as Margaret has said, tier one, no action is certainly not um, a, what I, this- It's tier zero. Tier zero. Pardon me. Um, we are not, we haven't been working on this for a year and a half because as Councilwoman Holman said, the staff had nothing else to do. This came, this is before us because there was a, a strong desire by people who own Eichlers to protect them, I think, is a good way of saying it. So I'd like to suggest to the board that we recommend to the council uh, a combination of tier one and tier two. Uh, I know there is very little difference. The only thing that I'm not sure about in tier two, and that would be my preference, is the addressing the erosion of support of single story overlay. I think it would be a very um, positive thing for the council to create a m way in which we can have an Eichler overlay in every one of these individual, ide individually identified neighborhoods in our design guidelines. Um, we haven't really talked about that, but I think that this, this document moves us in that direction. So I would like to suggest that we adopt a, a tier two approach, encourage the council to move forward with a tier two approach, and, and if maybe clarify what this, what an erosion of support of the single story overlay might suggest. Um, if I can jump in. So tier, tier, you had first said recommend tier one and tier two. So I think tier one is, um, if anything, is, is, is requested. I mean, that's, that's what we've heard at the workshop, et cetera, and that's what I think staff would like to have is tier one um, to, so that we can proceed with our individual review of two-story homes um, with a tool such as this that connects them. Um, so that would be, I think, now, if you jump to tier two and not do tier one, then um, then we're not using you know the the guidelines with the IR program, um, and 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 now what you're doing is suggesting that we um, allow a, a method through an ordinance for um, Eichler tracks to self-select, um, come forward with 
you know, 70 percent of the neighbors, uh, of the owners saying they want this to be imposed upon their neighborhood, just like the single story overlay is now. That's a process where if you have the CCNRs, you, you know, 60 percent is required. If you don't, 70 percent is required to come forward with an application to impose a zone on, you know, overlay. Um, so just creating the enabling ordinance to allow tracks to come forward is not imposing the Eichler district on any neighborhood. It's allowing a method whereby they could come forward. When we talk about erosion of support, that was with the single story overlay processes. We had several that came through that um, initially they had the minimum level of support to submit the application for rezoning. But during the process, people decided, changed their minds. They didn't want to be um, have that overlay. And so those didn't get passed through that process. So um, with an Eichler overlay, we would want to, of course, take some uh, mm -hmm. direction that would allow consideration of what happens when that happens um, during that process. Okay, so thank you for that um, clarification. I think in that, in uh, hearing that, I think what I would um, like, um, I'm hoping the board will do is adopt tier one uh, and um, and uh, 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 support the, sorry, I've got to get to the right page here. I'm sorry. I, I have to jump in again. Can we please not use the word adopt? Could we please, um, just cautionary, to say um, explore that, you know, whether it's worthwhile or not to explore tier one further and, um, and sure. recommend that the okay. council consider directing staff, yeah. basically. I was, I was thinking but did not say adopting an approach. So an approach is what, uh, obviously what we do is evaluate ideas and then make suggestions to the council. The council makes the final decision, but it's, it's their decision, not ours. So I think we can do this in one motion now. Um, I'm not hearing any problems with the proposed yet not adopted resolution on our pages. I, I think it provides an inclusion of the design guidelines as a tool in helping uh, inform the uh, alterations and additions to Eichler um, properties and neighborhoods. Uh, so I, I guess um, I'd like to hear a motion to um, to, to uh, inform the council of our um, uh, uh, what we think their approach should be to move forward. Martin, thank you, Chair Bauer. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, <clears throat> make a motion <clears throat> that <clears throat> the city at the uh, <clears throat> City Historic Resources Board <clears throat> um, uh, move to um, uh, uh, recommend to the council that they uh, <clears throat> adopt the um, resolution shown on our packet page 53. And referring to um, the uh, uh, your comment, Chair Bauer, about the uh, the different tiers, uh, would that be a separate separate motion? Oh, I think we should do it in one okay, good. because yeah. the, the tiers are ideas about how to move forward. Okay, yeah. Okay, and uh, also including in my motion then to um, include uh, the, uh, the idea uh, included and in, written in um, tier one, which is um, using in tandem the IR guidelines for two-story second floor floor home review and enhance IR privacy for Eichlers. Um, by enhance, um, uh, again, that's not any ordinance that we're uh, uh, suggesting, but uh, that'd be just exploring uh, that comment. Um, uh, part of tier one also includes in this diagram the idea of uh, ordinance adopting the guidelines. Um, uh, my motion is that, my, my wording right now is uh, not to uh, recommend any ordinance adopting the guidelines. But I'll, hear, I'll hear what the uh, board members have about that. But uh, because it's just gonna be, I think, just a, oh yeah, please go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. I, yeah. I know this is really hard to manage. Yeah. Um, we, what you are, I think your motion is to recommend adopt the resolution to ad, for the council to adopt the guidelines as, as voluntary. Right. You have a second 
and it would be nice to have a vote on that just alone, and okay. then proceed with the second one is my request. Okay. Uh, the second piece would be, you know, to discuss um, an ordinance that would connect it to the individual review guidelines sure. as a part of tier one. So if we could just get to the finish line on the guidelines and then the next discussion. Okay. So let yeah. so let's just. Um, you want to do the motion both or one or? Okay, well, let's just start with the motion with the uh, first motion is to adopt the uh, proposed uh, resolution that's uh, on our packet page 53. So. Which incorporates the proposed guidelines, voluntary guidelines, as part of our review process. Okay. Correct. Yes. All right. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All right. Uh, any discussion? I think we probably talked about this haven't voted yet. All right. If there is no discussion, um, would you like to rephrase the motion just yes, so we uh, have it clear for the record? Yes. I, I move that the Historic Resources Board uh, recommend to the City Council that they um, uh, adopt the resolution uh, shown on our packet page 53. All right. And that's been seconded by Margaret. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, now let's, Brandon, yeah, I had to leave. Okay, let's talk about um, our recommendations uh, as regards to uh, tier one, two, or three on page 56. Can I, can I ask a question? I'm sorry, I, um, as I'm looking through this, this is now referencing um, an Eichler overlay. So is there, and maybe I just didn't notice it in the guidelines. Is does it discuss an Eichler overlay in the guidelines? I know it it mentions all the and identifies all the tracts. So is that basically saying that each tract would be an Eichler overlay? I mean, how are those? No. I missed that. I'm sorry. Sorry, I need to jump in again. What you have in front of you and on the screen mm -hmm. are ideas without any exploration. Um, the exploration that would occur related to tier two would be if council were to direct us, staff, to embark upon a process that would go many months and probably a year to um, explore you know, an ordinance that would enable, just like the SSO ordinance uh -huh. process, that would enable tracks to volunteer, voluntarily come forward come, and self-select themselves with a minimum percentage of support from the owners to become an Eichler overlay. What the Eichler overlay would be is variable as well. It is could to be, be defined, is you know, because we haven't defined what that is. Yet. We haven't defined whether okay. the entirety of the guidelines would apply or one chapter or you know, right. Or, I think that's or, what I was missing that that yeah, reference it to hasn't Eichler been overlay, yeah. but there was no definition of it. So okay, I am. Okay. All right. Just want to clear that up. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Michael. Well, I think that's uh, very appropriate that we endorse the concept of an Eichler overlay district. Uh, at least the council can consider that as a, an action that we can take. I think we definitely should state something along those lines. All right, Roger, any comments? Um, I well, I'm looking here at this and it's, there's zero, tier zero, tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, are we voting on one of those tiers? No, we're no, there's to, no. Uh, okay, yeah, that's what I'm trying to what say. I, what I think might be best, I'm trying to help, um, and I realize this is difficult. Um, I think we just. If, if you're not inclined, for, if anyone, you could, you could say straw poll if tier zero voluntary is your opinion of the best way to move forward. Um, you could take a, tier, a straw poll to say if tier one you know, makes sense for, for staff to um, put in the report or it's in the minutes from the HRB meeting that the council will see. I think taking each one individually, not either or, would be a better approach. Well, I mean, it seems to me we're a historic resources board. I don't think we want zero. That's, you know, we're trying to help to guide, guide everybody. I'm not sure why we have to, there's an overlay between all of these. Why don't we just, come up with some sort of suggestions, combination of tier one and two, or one and two. I don't know, about three. Is there a way that we can just make a motion that we have reviewed this potential attachment B and our motion is to 
um, take the time to further develop it. So, because we're kind of stumbling over it, obviously. So I'd like. So to, instead um, of continuing stumbling, can we just have a motion to right. to accept it as an idea? And the motion would be to further investigate it. Okay, I'd like to um, uh, try to short circuit this. What seems to be circular discussion. I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to move that. The Historic Resources Board encouraged the, the um, City Council to create an ordinance that adopts the guidelines and that is used in tandem with the uh, individual review guidelines for second story and, and second floor home review. Uh, and that enhances the individual review privacy for Eichlers. And I'd like that to have an emphasis on neighborhood control and, gui and, um, and neighborhood guidance because I think local is, as local as you can get is the best. I so so that's, that's my motion. I second that motion. Okay, now a discussion of it? So, so this is a motion to encourage the council to move forward with these ideas. Essentially, it, it, they are the ones that are um, summarized in tier one, I would, um, uh, Imagine that in this review, an, I, the, an Eichler overlay might also come out of it. So, I, I don't want to. I don't want to put that as part of the motion, but I think that's an, uh, that could be a logical um, uh, something that would logically be included. The reason I uh, seconded uh, Chair Bauer's motion is uh, the idea of uh, local control. Um, we've seen great success in Professorville Historic District, for example. We have two national listed historic districts for Eichlers. Um, that's all neighborhood local control, and um, I, boy, that's I think the best administrative voice there is, is uh, uh, majority of homeowners in different districts uh, uh, saying, uh, here's what we want, and then do their normal application process. That's why I supported uh, Chair Bauer's motion. Staff opinion? Yeah, I, I don't want to offer my opinion. What I do want to say is, just for the public, that I sense restlessness, and I hope we don't get to hissing again. Um, what, what I'd like to say is, um, any ordinance that would connect these guidelines to the individual review program and process would first have to go to the Planning and Transportation Commission in a public hearing with notice cards sent to everybody all over again in much ahead of the meeting um, because it's an ordinance that be has some, some teeth to it. That would have to go after the council directs us to pursue that option because again, that is staff resources to be spent on a process. Hopefully that's clear to the public. Right. This is a recommendation for a path forward and that's all it is and it's, you know, th that means we would just start a second ordinance crafting process. Correct? Uh, it would be the first ordinance because what this is is a resolution. Resolutions do not have any um, power to right. change ordinances, only to acknowledge the existence of these as a useful tool, okay. voluntary Any tool. other comments on the motion? Well, I just, I'm sorry, sometimes I backtrack. So um, there is a potential that each individual tract could follow a different tier. I mean, okay, we're not but, saying but that. Let, let me, I know, I let me interrupt. I, I don't want to have actually get in the weeds in this. This okay. is a direction. This is a direction. It wasn't and the council, no, the council has to move. They have to make the decision about how they want us to move. So I'd like to focus this on just the direction that we want council to take, not on the individual specifics, which of course will be discussed in great detail. Is that okay? Yes. I, I don't mean to cut off your thoughts. They're legitimate and valuable, but um, that's not, we're, we're at the 30,000 foot level here, I think. Right. Okay, other comments? All right, if there are no further comments, vote on the measure. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. I think that concludes um, public hearing on the Eichler design guidelines. We move to the last item in our on our agenda, which is approval of minutes from the January 25th meeting. Martin. Uh, I'd uh, like to thank members of the public who have uh, joined us uh, this morning. It's, um, I know it's taking valuable time out of your days today. And uh, again, this is a very important subject that we were discussing today. So thank you for members of the public for coming in. So, okay. I, I'd also like to follow that up with, uh, with an appreciative um, th 
uh, with my appreciation that people will uh, did take the time to come out, express uh, lots of differing views, it helps to inform our decisions and it will certainly help to inform the council's decisions. So even if we didn't reach the conclusion you wanted us to, it, all of the comments are valuable. So thank you for coming. All right, minutes. Any issues? Um, I don't hear any board comments on minutes. I move to approve the minutes. All right, we have motion to approve minutes. A second? second. Roger seconds. Any changes and deletions? All right, all in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We're just approving the minutes. Did they get approved? They yes. So, um, M Margaret moved to approve the minutes and Roger seconded. All right. Um, board member comment, oh, subcommittee will meet uh, after this meeting. Uh, any other board member comments or announcements? I see none. So with that, oh, oh uh, Emily. Yeah, this, the subcommittee for 526 Waverly will be meeting just to make sure that it's clear. I'm sorry, where? The 526 five, Waverly facade restoration will be meeting, not any other subcommittee. Right, it's yeah, the right 526. Now. And yeah. where will we meet? we we'll meet right here. Okay, right here, fine. Okay, <laughs> uh, no other information and no other comments. Meetings adjourned. <laughs>